Good morning, everybody, and good morning to those who are watching online around the country and around the world. Welcome to this amazing Crossroads family we have, and to those who are in the house, special welcome to you for being here and, and, and being part of this. I really believe God's going to do some, some great things. I pray and believe that every single person that is hearing my voice right now, that God just takes your faith to a, a, a whole nother level, wherever it is. Uh, next week, we're going to be uh, right after the second service, we're going to be having a Taste of Crossroads luncheon. It's a great way for me to get to know you a little bit better, you to get to know us a little bit better, whether you've been coming just this is your first week or whether you've been coming for a while just want to say, I want to check out uh, a little bit more. It's going to be in the cafe, which is over there, and you get a free meal, home-cooked meal on, uh, as part of this, but it's a, a great way just to, just to start plugging in and things. Uh, I, you know, we've been taking a, a look at the, the story, I mean, uh, this topic of healing and uh, the, this whole thing on healer. And we're seeing that God loves to heal. He really does. And not just our physical bodies. He loves to heal. He loves to heal relationships. In fact, just talking to somebody after the first service that God has done just a miracle uh, in the last uh, little, little while of somebody with her and, a, and a, her daughter and just healing with, uh, with that. God loves to heal emotions. God loves to heal our memories. God loves to heal our broken hearts, and we've all had all of those. And so God's just a, a God who loves to heal. And we said the first week that there's this gap that we see a lot of times between what, uh, what, we, what God wants to do, what we see in the Bible, uh, and what we actually experience in life in regards to, to healing. And we just say, and, and say this, don't miss next week because what we're gonna be talking about next week, we're gonna finish up the series and we're gonna be talking about, okay, what happens when we pray for people and they don't get better? And we've all been there, right? And what happens when we pray for somebody to, to, to be healed and they're not only healed, they die. What about that? Because we all struggle with what, what happens, and we're going to take a look at what the Bible says about that, and there's going to be a special, special testimony that you're not going to want to miss uh, next week as, as part of that. But why do we have this gap? 
I think part of the reason is because of our, uh, our, our mindset that we, that we have, our worldview. And go ahead, there's, there's really three basic worldviews. And the first one is the, uh, is the Eastern mindset. In the Eastern mindset, there's God up here, there's nature. And really, those are all connected in everything. That, that there's really that, that God is nature, nature is God. That's why you can worship a rock, you can worship a cow, you can worship the sun, you can worship anything. Because it's all inter, intermingled there. That's a, a more of an Eastern mindset. Western mindset's very different from that. And that is there's God who created everything. And there's the natural order. He made laws and he he made things like that, but really never the twain shall meet. We kind of believe that there's a God out there, a lot of people, and then, uh, but, but we don't really, uh, you know, there's not that much interaction between God and the natural order. But may I present to you a third mindset that I believe is truly the best mindset, and that's a biblical mindset. And that's, yes, God is uh, a supernatural being that we know, that we worship, that we love, and he always, he did make a natural order. He put laws in effect and everything, but because there's a dotted line here, God can do anything he wants and God can, can, can intervene into our life. God can intervene into the natural order. He is supernatural. Okay, that means he is above the nature that he created. He's above those things, so he can do anything that he, that he wants to. And I don't know about you, but I'm really glad he can. For instance, there's, uh, there's the law of buoyancy, right? Uh, people cannot walk on water. But if you're the one that created that law, you can supersede that law, and that is why Jesus was able to walk on water. The sun usually doesn't stand still, does it? But if you created the universe, and you created the sun and all the other stars, and you created the earth, and you created rotate the laws of motion and the laws of orbit and things like this, you can make Venus turn backwards, which it does. You can make the sun do backflips if you want because because you are super natural also dead people usually stay dead but if you're the author of life you can you can bring life to anybody that you want anytime you want and that's why Jesus was able to raise people from the dead that's how he was able to get out of the dead and go be bopping back into life right because he's the author of of, of life. So sometimes maybe we need to get more of a, of a biblical worldview. And here's the point that God can intervene anytime He wants. As, as believers in a supernatural God, we should not only just that, that it's a logical thing to realize that God can do supernatural, we should be expecting that. A supernatural God can and will do supernatural things in our midst. Amen. And something. So, what we're going to take a look is another reason that we have uh, that we have problems with with this is because of faith. Throughout the Bible, God says there is a connection between the mir miracles we see and the faith that we have, including healing. There is a connection there. Uh, and so, the the second thing we're going to be taking a look at three people today, three different individuals that they all have different levels of faith. One has very little faith. One has, uh, has halfway faith, and the other has full faith in God. And the first person we're going to look at has little faith. And the person with, with little faith, here's the situation, the background, that, that Peter, James, and John were on, with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. We call it that because Jesus transfigured in front of them, and, and, and God spoke. Uh, Moses and, uh, and Elijah, they showed up there at that time. It was a pretty happening place on the, on the mountain. But but while that was happening, at the same time, down in the valley, what you had is you had uh, a man who presented his, his son to, uh, to the disciples for healing. And nothing, nada, not a thing took place. Here's that situation. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. I love, man, can you imagine that? that picture. What are you arguing about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive him out, but he, couldn't, but he could not. 
Now remember, Jesus had just given them power and authority to do exactly what happened here. Listen to this in Luke chapter 9. When Jesus had ta- called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure disease. And he went, sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the, the sick. In other words, don't miss this. We are empowered to do far more than we're seeing in our life. We're empowered to do far more than what's happening uh, around us. But here's the question. Why did the disciples, in this case, why could they not, why could they not heal this guy? Because they, they had it happen a time and time again before when they were sent out there. And so I think here's the problem. Matthew says it was because of lack of faith. Mark says it was because of lack of prayer. Is the, is the, the Bible you know, going against each other? Of course not. Those things go together, don't they? If you have a lack of faith... You're going to have a lack of prayer. If you have a lack of prayer, you're going to have a lack of faith. If you have a lot of prayer, you're going to have a lot of faith. And if you have a lot of faith, you're going to be praying more and more and more because you know that is what, uh, what, what things happen. And so he, Jesus said this, O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long will I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? All three gospels that record this, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, they, they record him saying that exact word, unbelieving. And here's what the word in the Greek means, unbelieving. He says, not worthy of confidence or untrustworthy. Yikes. Do you know what that's saying? That's saying when we do not have faith in God, it is us saying, God, I really think you're untrustworthy in this. I don't have enough faith that you're gonna bring me through in in this. And it's saying that I lack confidence in, in you. And the number one cause of all spiritual failure is a lack of faith in God. Eventually, that's the, that's the problem in all of it. Bring me the boy. So they brought the boy. When, Jesus saw, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming on the mouth. I've seen this. It's ugly. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has, the, has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. Let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus ask that question of how long has he been there? Was it because that would make any difference whatsoever in Jesus' ability to heal? Of course not, right? And that made no difference whatsoever. Uh, and, I mean, Jesus never went, oh my gracious, how long do you say you've been sick? Sorry, that, you know, that, that, went out, that, uh, that, that went out a few years ago. He never did anything like that. And so, um, but, and so I think Jesus asked that question for us and for them realizing this has been happening for a long, long time. The father said he's been happening since, since he was a, a kid. So we're realizing this is a bad situation that's been going a long time, but it didn't freak Jesus out in all about how long it's been. It often has thrown him into fire and, and water or water to kill him. Luke, the doctor, uh, said this, said a spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It ser- scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I think this is incredible that the father was very, very, very aware of the power of Satan in, this, in his boy's life, but he was not very aware of the power of God in this boy's life. And doesn't that happen to us? A lot of times we are very aware of the power of addiction that it has over us. And we may not be as aware of the power of God to overcome that addiction in our life. We may have the, 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 we are very aware of of the sickness in our life, but we're less aware of the power of God to heal those sickness. We are very aware of our weaknesses, right? But it, we're, we're not as aware of the strength of God to help us in our weakness. We are very aware of our lack, but we're not as aware of God's provision in, in our, our life. And I think God is saying, man, he wants to to do something completely different there. And I love this next word. He says, the the man says the word but. Just but. But that little thing is a light. It's just, it's a nugget of of faith. It's a mustard seed of faith. And that's all uh, all it took. I love, Sylvia and I are very different in how we eat fruit. When I eat fruit, I snarf it down and I discard the, the, the seed. She does not a lot of the time. What she does is she sees what that seed can do. And so many times she'll grab some seeds and she will put it in a, a pot and she will nurture it and water it and watch that grow until it becomes 
becomes a full plant. That's what Jesus does. Jesus sees this little, this little thing of faith, this little mustard seed of faith, and he doesn't discard it. He, he nourishes it. He waters it. And we're going to see some great things happen as a result of, of that. I love this, that, God, that, that Jesus doesn't just wait for us to go halfway and then he'll meet us halfway. All he takes is we just take a step, and man, he comes running and goes the rest of the way. Isn't that what happened with the prodigal son? The prodigal son took one step towards his dad, and his dad's running towards him. I love the fact that we serve a God that runs towards us. And here's something, too, is the Bible, I believe, is filled with examples of just that little butt making a big difference. One example of that is, is Martha. Remember, Martha lost her, her brother, Lazarus. He's dead. She sends some message to Jesus along with her, her sister Mary to, to come heal our brother, and he doesn't come. I mean, he doesn't come, and you can imagine how devastated she was. So she makes a statement of fact first. She says this, if you had only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It's a statement of fact. It's true. But then she gives a statement of faith, and she says, but. But even now, the Father will do whatever you ask for, Jesus. And, that, and the, all it took was that little mustard seed of faith that she had, and Lazarus rose from, rose from the dead. And so here we go down with this. Now in our story today, one little word was all the invitation that Jesus needed to, to heal. He said this, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. The man actually said to Jesus, the Son of God, God in human flesh, if you can do anything. And think about that. I mean, think of how ridiculous that is, that God, I wonder whether God can actually do anything. He's really saying, God, I'm not sure you can help me, Jesus. I'm not sure about it. I'm not sure if, if you can do anything. And why might that boy's dad have struggled with, uh, with believing that it can happen? I think there's two huge reasons. Number one is because the severity of the disease, of the, of the problem that's there. Can we be real and can we be honest and say there are some diseases that scare us more than others, right? When we hear those words. There are some things that, that, that when those, we hear those words that they can frighten us very, very bad. But we have to, and, and sometimes it affects our prayer, the faith that we have. I mean, think about this, that sometimes, can, you, can we just be honest and real that sometimes we have less faith when we're praying for stage four cancer than when we're praying for a headache? And sometimes we have less faith that God's really gonna answer if somebody's in a wheelchair than if we're just praying for a sore ankle or something like that. But we have to understand for God, it's no, one's no more difficult than the other. God is omnipotent. That means he is all powerful. That means it is no more difficult for him to lift five pounds than to five million tons. That's the thing. That it's no more difficult for him to, to heal stage four cancer than it is for him to heal something over here. There's no, there's no comparison. There's no levels if you can do everything. If everything is possible for you, there's no level of impossibility that there a lot of times we think that there is for us. And another thing is, is this, it was the length of the time that, that he had been praying. His son had been sick from the time he was a little boy. And it, can we, again, can we be honest and real that sometimes when we pray for something over and over and over for year after year after year that sometimes we can lose a little faith in that? I prayed for my, for my dad to come to faith in Christ for over a decade. I prayed probably for two decades for my brother to come to faith uh, in Christ. And I'll be honest with you that sometimes towards the end of that, it was more difficult than at the start of praying for, for that. But again, time has no difference with, with God. I mean, think about it. Jesus healed a lady who had been bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. Jesus healed another lady who had been an invalid for 18 years. Jesus healed a man who had been an invalid for 38 years. Jesus healed a blind man who had been blind from, from birth. But Peter and John healed a crippled man who had been crippled from birth and he was over 40 years old. And Jesus healed somebody who was dead for four days. That's not just dead. That is you stink dead, right? That is, you smell, you need something to put on because you're dead, right? And, and again, the, the length of time made no difference to Jesus. It could have been a year from that. It could have been four years from that. It had no difference. When, you're the, when you can do anything and you're author of life, sometimes we struggle with it when it's time or the severity, but it is no different for God. And if we could realize that, it could make a difference in our prayer. And listen to this. Jesus' response to if you can faith. If you can, Jesus uh, said Jesus, 
Everything is possible to him who believes. Jesus took exception to this man's word, if you can. I wonder if he still does. I wonder if he still does when we say, God, if you can do, if you can do anything, I wonder if he still takes some exception to that. But what Jesus is basically saying to this guy, too, is he's saying, what do you mean, if I can? There is no sin. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no infirmity. There is nothing that I can't, that I can't take care of. And by the way, don't miss this. By the way, anybody who believes in me, there is no, which is us, there is no sin, no sickness, no disease or infirmity that is too much for those who believe in him as well. Now look at the difference between these words. The man said this. The man said, if you can do anything, so wrap your mind around anything. And Jesus says, not only can I do anything, I can do everything. Now, just pause right here. This will change our life when we transfer from that. Then we transfer our faith from God, if you can do anything, to believe in God, I know you can do everything. That will change our life our life when that happens. And the father did, I think, several things that were good. Look at this. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And the first thing he did is he had some faith, didn't he? The boy had, and the man had some faith. Otherwise, he wouldn't have brought his son to, uh, to Jesus. And he had faith enough to stick around even when in it, things weren't working the way he was hoping to. And he had enough faith to make the declaration, I have some faith. But then here's also, I love this guy because he also said, I don't have the faith I want to have. I don't have the faith that I should be having in this situation. But then he also said, but Jesus, I'm coming to you. Can you help me in my unbelief? Can you help me have enough faith to, to believe for what I should be believing for? And that's maybe where a lot of us are sometimes. Maybe we'll pray for something. We have enough faith to pray. Otherwise, we wouldn't be praying, right? But then the other thing is, is too, is, is that we have the, the faith to say, or maybe we can be honest and say, I don't have the faith I should have a lot of times when I pray. But here's the great thing. We can come boldly, the Bible says, before God and say, God, I need to be more bold in my faith. I need more faith to be praying for what I'm praying for right here, for that relationship, for that healing, for that problem, for that situation. God, I'm struggling with faith, so give me some faith so I can pray in the power that I want to have. And it says this, um, how Jesus said, when Jesus saw the crowd, he was running to the scene. He rebuked the evil spirit, you deaf and mute spirit. I love how Jesus calls it out. And he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Jesus attributed this sickness to the demonic, which he does a couple of times, but not always. There's some things he never, never costs a demon, just heals the person. So some sicknesses that we have are because of demonic activity in our life. Satan really comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Other times it's just sicknesses that we have in this, in this world. The spirit shrieked. Imagine you being here and watching this. Convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Now, can you imagine if you were that father? Can you imagine being there, and all of a sudden, your boy falls to the ground, and it looks like he is dead? I mean, and can you imagine just the, the pain, the, 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 the everything, the, the remorse, the, 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 you know, just so the, the whatever? Can you imagine that? But then all of a sudden, you think he's dead, but suddenly Jesus reaches out and your boy comes back to life and, and healed and, and delivered and free. Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the, 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 just the, the overwhelming happiness at that, at that moment when you see that happen? And it all happened even though the guy didn't have much faith. He had the faith that he needed for Jesus to do what Jesus could do. Jesus took that little mustard seed of faith and he healed his, his boy. The next one is halfway faith. And this is a guy we talked about, and we mentioned him the first, the first message in this series. And this is the guy that he was a, a leper. And he had, he had leprosy, and he came to Jesus, and he fell at his feet. And he said, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, this man had halfway faith. He knew Jesus could do something, right? He knew Jesus could do that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have come there. But he just didn't know whether Jesus would heal him or not. And I love what Jesus did. Jesus uh, did something, and then he said something. The first thing that Jesus did was he, he, he touched him. 
And, and that may not mean much to you, but if you're a leper and you've never been touched in months or years by another human being and suddenly somebody touches you, I, uh, I, that, that probably was incredible to him. And then the other thing is Jesus said, I am willing, be clean. And once again, so we see Jesus declaring, I can do everything. And then also that he's saying, I'm willing and I, 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 love, I love to heal as, as well. And so here's the thing too. He said, immediately he was cured of his, of his leprosy. Again, I asked the question when we first did that. Did Jesus lose any of his ability then than he, or now that he had then? Of course not. Did Jesus, he, uh, does Jesus not care anymore like he did before? Again, no, no way because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And person number three has amazing faith. His name was Bartimaeus. And he believed God could heal him, and he believed God would heal him. It was just a problem of getting to Jesus for for him. Then Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man named Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. So he was blind, that we know the problem. We don't know how he got that way. We don't know how long it's been that way, but we know that he's been reduced to having to beg. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He shouts to get Jesus' attention, and this one I love. What does he call him? He calls him the son of David. That may not mean a lot to you. That meant a ton to the people in those days, because what he was saying is, Jesus, I believe you're the Messiah. And I think this is absolutely incredible that here's a blind man and he recognizes Jesus as the Messiah and there's this whole bunch of, of, of seeing Pharisees that refuse to see what's right in front of him and refuse to believe that he's the Messiah. The blind man sees better than the, than the people with sight. And did you hear what, what Bartimaeus was asking Jesus? He simply asked him, have mercy on me. How many times have we whispered that? or shouted that to God, God have mercy on me. God have mercy on my friend. God have mercy on this situa- situation. Have you, have you ever longed for something? And I mean truly longed for something. Maybe you longed to be loved. Maybe you, you were in love and you just longed for that person. Maybe you're separated from that person and you longed to be with that, uh, with that person. We've all longed for, for food. When t- sometimes when we're hungry. We've longed for, for drink when we're, when we're thirsty. We have, we've longed for sleep when we're sleepy. And longed is one of the most powerful words there is because it's not just saying, I'd like that. It's saying, I absolutely, I, I, from, from the center of, of who I am, I, I need that. I, I, I want that. Have you, ever wondered what, have you ever wondered what God longs for? Because God says in his Bible, he longs for some things. And here's one of the things that I bet a lot of us never, ever thought that God longed for, for your life and for my life. This is what he says. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. You ever thought about that? You ever understood that God longs to be gracious for you? With that deep thing that I was just talking about, how much you've ever longed for something, God longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. Blessed are all who wait for him. God isn't just interested in being gracious to you. God doesn't just want to be gracious to you. God longs to be gracious to to you. And he says, and you know what that means? That means we can cry out to, to, to God just like Bartimaeus did. And we can see God do some amazing things just like Bartimaeus did. And here's something that, uh, imagine, so here this man is crying out for God to touch him. And watch what the crowd does. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And I want you to know there will always be voices that will, that will try to calm you down from crying out for your healing or for you or for somebody else. They will always, they will try to stop you from pressing in to your, to your miracle. And, and maybe those voices, a lot of times, those voices are coming from our own mind, aren't they? And other times they're coming from Satan himself. Other times they're coming from people around that should be supporting us and things. But, but here's the thing that we learned from Bartimaeus. Keep shouting. Keep believing. Keep praying. Don't you let those, uh, those voices inside your head or any other thing keep you, silence you. Let them embolden you to pray like you've never prayed. Yeah. 
Jesus stopped and, and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up. On your feet, he's calling you. Thro throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. Think about what's going through Bartimaeus' mind, that Jesus is calling for him. This is his, his moment. And I love, I got goosebumps. I love who Jesus used to bring him, to uh, Bartimaeus, to him. He used the very people that were telling him to shut up just a few minutes, just a few seconds before. That, and I want you to understand this, that God can use the same people that try to keep you down or all the very things that try to put, go in your way, the very barriers that you've bit up in front of you. He can use those barrier, various things, those very things to be the avenue on which you come to him. And he says this, then Jesus asked him what, it seems like a silly question. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus, Jesus asked, what would you do? What do, you, what do you mean, what do I want you to do? I want, can you think, fix my slinky, please? That's what I really need. I want to be healed. I want to be healed. And I love it that Jesus knew what he needed. Jesus knew what he wanted. But there's sometimes Jesus loves when we say it, when we call it for what it is, and we are specific about what we need and what we, and what we, we want. And listen to this. I love this. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. His shout was specific. He said, have mercy on me. His, his request was specific. He said, I want to see. And he was persistent. He would not let any voices inside of him or anything else keep him away from his, his healing. Go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Again, right now he goes point blank to saying there is a relationship between your faith and your healing. And understand that. And then things, think about this. These people's faith, they, they went from almost nothing whatsoever, just this little mustard seed to God, I believe you can do anything and everything all the time and everything in between. But Jesus touched every single one of them. And here's the thing, too, that they all, they all came to Jesus. They all gave the request to him. And they all, they all also persevered and kept going, even when they had a lot of reason to, to, to stop. Here's what I believe with all my heart. I believe the more we pray for healing in our, in our life and in this congregation, the more we're going to see God heal. And the more we see God heal, the more testimonies we're going to have. The more testimonies we have, the more we're going to pray. The more we pray, the more we're going to see. And it's going to be this incredible, wonderful thing that keeps going and going and going. Because I am convinced that God is a God who loves, loves, loves to heal. In January of 2022, uh, David and I both had COVID. David's COVID got uh, worse very quickly and was hospitalized with COVID pneumonia. The nurse practitioner was questioning David about the his, you know, what he might be doing. She was asking, are you taking any kind of um, supplements or whatever? Because there's something not right with your blood work. And she called the Living Cancer Center and we got a call to go in the very next day. So we went in and met with an oncologist. The oncologist shared with us that he may have a tumor. The doctor then said that I want you to do a couple of things. We're gonna set you up for um, an, a diagnostic MRI and then we'll get the results and see where we go from there. Um, that took a little while, but the day came that we had the MRI. We got the results that it was indeed a tumor and then we were referred to a liver specialist. Of course, it was very shocking, you know, to hear the results. And uh, the day that uh, uh, we found out the, the news, um, Nina and I both sat down and I just start crying, a little, a little cry. <clears throat> and then after that, we talked about where do we go from here? We already knew that 
God was uh, the person we needed to go to. And then after that, it was just, uh, I, I'd been healed several times before in my life, and, and I knew exactly what I needed to do. From the beginning, we could see that God was working. We got so many different reports and, and blessings. We realized then that it really wasn't a bad thing that we got COVID because it was the COVID diagnosis that led to the finding of this tumor. There was blessings in um, just being able to share with others what God was doing in this situation and um, the prayers alone have been the biggest blessing. We have so many people praying for David, and we truly believe that, that the Lord poured into him with those, you know, with those moments of people praying and laying hands on him, uh, because we've already seen an additional decrease in the size of the tumor. He has no longer been receiving the standard um, chemotherapy treatment that he was receiving. He's now on immunotherapy and we see continual shrinkage in the tumor. So we know that the Lord is hearing the prayers and answering them. You know, I, I don't want uh, anyone to be afraid. Afraid, you know. I, I want to leave uh, people with the thought, you know, and the process of them not being afraid. And, uh, you know, and I, I just want to leave them with some hope.